In our Torah reading for this week from Parashat Yitro, we have the climax, or at least one of a few climaxes of the entire Torah, the revelation at Sinai. Now, when I was reading this parasha, I tried to imagine just how our ancient Israelite ancestors must have felt in that moment. Just a few weeks removed from being slaves in Egypt, having directly witnessed God's power firsthand. Remember, it started off small, turning the water of the Nile into blood, and then the other plagues, and it culminated in the mighty act contravening the laws of nature, splitting an entire sea. The Israelites walking across the seabed with towering columns of water to their left and to their right. And this week, we, we read about the terrifying scene in which this supernatural God revealed God's self to the whole Israelite community, not just to the elite, not even just to the men, but to every single Israelite. And the Torah recounts, "Biyot haboker v'hai kolot uvrakim v'anan kaved al hahar," that as morning dawned, there was thunder, and lightning, and a dense cloud upon the mountain. The kol shofar chazak, there was a loud call of the horn or the shofar, v'chared kol ha'am b'machane. Every single person, every single Israelite who was in the camp trembled with fear. And Moses led the people out of the camp toward God, and they took their places at the foot of the mountain. The Har Sinai Ashen, Kulo Mipne Asher, Yarad Alav, Adonai, Ba'esh, Vayaal Ashanu, Keoshen, Hakivshan, Vayachar, Kol Hahar Meod. Now Mount Sinai was all covered in smoke, for Adonai had come down upon it in fire. The, the smoke rose like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled violently. It's quite a scene, the Torah paints, quite a, quite a picture. The blare of the horn grew louder and louder, and as Moses spoke, God answered him in thunder. And God came down upon Mount Sinai on top of the mountain. That God that we read about in this scene, the God that revealed God's self to the Israelites, was a God who came into the world and related to humans through might, through these wondrous and miraculous acts of nature. And yet today, very few of us would say that God controls the weather. We might say that this week's terrible earthquake in Turkey and Syria was of biblical proportions, but we don't really mean to say that God chose to send that earthquake to punish them. In our modern day, we don't really think about God as the cause of such natural catastrophes, and all the more so as the cause of supernatural events that suspend the laws of nature. That kind of God is difficult for many, and I'll include myself in that, for many of us modern people to believe in. In fact, if you ask Jews the question, do you believe in the God that's described in the Torah? According to the Pew Research Survey, only 26% of American Jews say yes. Only 26%, only a quarter of American Jews believe in the God as portrayed in the Torah. But even though so many of us don't believe in that kind of God, if I asked you when was a time that you felt close to God, that you felt holiness in your life, I bet almost all of us could come up with an answer. Think about it. Think about that for just a moment. When is a time when you felt close to God? Maybe in nature, maybe in a hospital room, maybe here in the sanctuary, lifting your voice, joining that voice with the voices of many other people. Could be anything for any one of us. 
and a midrash, a rabbinic explanation on the revelation at Sinai explains that when God appeared to the Israelites on, on the top of the mountain, that every single Israelite experienced that revelation differently. Even though God, the God that presented God's self was the same, God was one, we each Israelite experienced God differently according to our own ability, our own life experiences, according to who we were. And even though the Jewish tradition says that each one of us, each one of us in this room, our souls were present on Mount Sinai in that moment, each one of us senses God's presence in our own lives differently. Those of you who have sensed God, have you ever tried to explain how it feels to someone else, how that moment of being close to God felt? It's, it's not easy. In fact, many philosophers or theologians would say it is impossible to put into words exactly what that feels like. And, and yet, for those of us who have felt close to God, I would wager that it probably was not at the foot of Mount Sinai in a thunderstorm or between a parted sea. No, in, in our lives in this day, we see God in different ways. When we come together as a community after moments of loss or crisis, we may sense God among us. When we look into the eyes of a new baby or a mother who just gave birth, the miracle of life, the miracle of God is not so hard to believe in. Godliness exists in this world when a child, uncorrupted by the hatred and bias in our world, sees racism or bigotry and asks, why? Don't you see that we are all equal, all human, all made in the image of God, all the same? Godliness exists in this world when we open our hand to the needy when we are in the hospital praying that we or a loved one can live to see another day, when we show up at a shiva or a funeral to show that those who remain, to show those who remain that they are not alone, that they are loved in their moment of loss. When we visit them, we bring God with us. Reform Judaism has long expressed the idea that revelation was not a one-time event. God did not reveal God's self at Sinai, give us the Torah, and then shut the gates uh, from heaven to earth for good. The Reform Movement's 1937 Columbus Platform asserts, quote, revelation is a continuous process confined to no one group and to no one age, God reveals himself not only in the majesty, beauty, and orderliness of nature, but also in the vision and moral striving of the human spirit. God reveals God's self in the vision and moral striving of the human spirit. In other words, when we have, the, in other words, we have the ability to sense God in our own day, and to bring God into the world when we act with righteousness and goodness and godliness. In fact, according to the 20th century theologian Abraham Joshua Heschel, who we read a bit earlier, without our help, without human action, he writes, quote, God is in exile in this world. He writes, our task as Jews is to bring God back into the world, into our lives. And in our day, in our modern day, God needs us to bring God back into the world to, to reveal what God is, what God can be with our help. So when we look around the world and we wonder where is God when 74% of our people wonder where is God, perhaps we're looking in the wrong places. The book of Kings tells the story of the prophet Elijah, you know, the guy who goes around to everybody's house drinking wine on Pesach. Uh, we read about his origin story in the book of Kings. 
and we read about his encounter with God, which was very different and very similar from that of our ancient Israelites standing at Sinai. The Bible says, and I'm quoting from the book of Kings, there was a great and mighty wind splitting mountains and shattering rocks by the power of God. But God was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But God was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, fire. But God was not in the fire. And after the fire, a kol de mama daka, a still, small voice. God came to Elijah not in a mighty act of nature, but in a still, small voice. A still, small voice that exists inside of each one of us. And if we slow down enough to listen, we can amplify that voice's message and bring a little bit more of God into any God-forsaken place. That is our task as Jews, and that is my prayer for each of you, each of us, this Shabbat. Can you hear May it be God's will.